Hisashi Ouchi's case is the most extreme radiation death case in history. The technician at the Tsukimura plant was subjected to radiation levels equivalent to being found at the epicenter of the Hiroshima bomb. Today, we will review what happened that fateful morning in 1999 and the hell that man lived the following 83 days. <laughs> Nuclear power has become a very important source of electricity for Japan. Due to its geographical and geological situation, it is highly dependent on energy imported from abroad. Today, nuclear power plants provide approximately 30% of the country's electricity. The Tokai Nuclear Power Plant is located in Ibaraki Prefecture. It is located near the town of Tokaimura, approximately 110 km from Tokyo, and became Japan's first commercial nuclear power plant. It was founded in 1966 and focused on nuclear fuel conversion by producing uranium rods for other reactors until 1999. But before proceeding with the explanation of how the plant worked and how the accident occurred, I want to emphasize that I am not an expert in nuclear physics or chemistry and that I have barely managed to simplify the procedures to expose them in this video. If you know in depth the ins and outs of the procedures carried out in this type of power plant and the exact reason for the accident beyond the superficial, please leave a comment with your explanation. I'm sure it will be of great help to everyone else. Having said that, we are going to proceed with how and why the terrible accident was unleashed. The nuclear power plant was controlled by Japan Nuclear Fuel Conversion Corporation, also called the JCO and its mission was to convert enriched uranium hexafluoride into uranium dioxide fuel, which served as the first step in the production of fuel rods for the nuclear reactors of nearby power plants. This process of combining nuclear products involves a fission process with the potential to produce radiation and explosive energy. And as you can imagine, handling these products poses an extreme risk for technicians and engineers. Therefore, it requires precision and expert workers to perform the procedure safely. To produce such uranium fuel, a chemical purification procedure with three crucial steps is required. The first is based on adding certain amounts of uranium oxide powder in a dissolution tank to produce uranium nitrate using nitrate acid. In the second, the mixture obtained is carefully transported to an intermediate tank specially designed to prevent the fission process from reaching critical levels. In a precipitation tank intended to capture any remaining nuclear residual contaminant, ammonia is added forming a solid product. In the last step, the uranium oxide is placed in the dissolution tank until it's purified. This purification is carried out without enriching the isotopes and is considered a wet process technology, in which Japan is highly specialized. On September 28, 1999, a shipment of uranyl nitrate to other plants was planned. It was JCO's first shipment for a reactor in three years, and workers at the facility were pressured to start dissolving and mixing high-purity and rich uranium oxide with nitrate acid, without the proper qualifications and required preparations in place for such a procedure. The technicians followed the steps of the JCO operations manual, but this manual was not approved by the STA, the Japan Science and Technology Agency. All these security flaws added up until the catastrophe occurred. The rush and lack of safety checks and procedures ended up causing the technicians to pour the products by hand, mix them in stainless steel barrels, and from there directly pour them into the precipitation tank. In a suitable situation, this discharge should have been carried out by storing the urine and nitrate inside a surge tank and gradually pumping it into the precipitation tank in 2.4 kg increments. At around 10.35 am on September 30th, the precipitation tank reached a critical mass when its capacity was overwhelmed. The nuclear fuel conversion standard specified in the 1996 GCO operation manual dictated the proper procedures regarding the dissolution of uranium oxide dust in a designated dissolution tank. The tall and narrow geometry of the intermediate tank was designed to safely contain the solution and avoid critical levels. In contrast, the precipitation tank had not been designed to contain unlimited amounts of this type of solution. The wide cylindrical shape of the tank meant that these critical levels were reached. The workers bypassed the buffer tanks entirely. The dangerous radiation level was reached after technicians added a seventh cube of liquid uranyl nitrate and reached to 18% with uranium-235 to the tank. The amount added at that point was seven times the legal mass limit specified by the STA. In short, the workers were manually pouring an amount that exceeded safe limits into a tank that was not designed for such a dump. Uncontrolled nuclear fission was immediately unleashed. The chain reaction became self-sustaining. 
emitting intense gamma and neutron radiation into the facility. The three workers who were there that day were Hisashi Ouchi, Masato Shinohara, and Yutaka Yokokawa. Ouchi was perched above the rim of the tank, covering the top with his body. Shinohara was assisting him from a platform as he poured the solution. Yokokawa was sitting at the desk at a distance of 4 meters. The three technicians observed a blue flash, possibly from the emanation of a type of radiation called Cherenkov radiation. Gamma radiation alarms immediately began to sound. During the following hours, nuclear fission produced continuous chain reactions. Ouchi and Shinohara immediately began experiencing pain, nausea, and breathing difficulties. Ouchi received the most radiation of the three, which resulted in impairing mobility, coherence, and loss of consciousness. The three technicians evacuated the area. None of them knew at the time the impact of the accident, and neither did they know how to inform their superiors or the authorities. It was a worker from the adjacent building who noticed the state of the technicians and called the emergency team. An ambulance took them to the nearest hospital. Nuclear fission fragments contaminated the fuel reprocessing building and reached the outside of the facility. The next morning, a team of experts was able to stop the chain reaction by draining the water from the cooling jacket installed in the tank. A solution of boric acid, which has neutron absorption properties, was added to reduce the mass to subcritical levels. By mid-afternoon, plant workers and residents of the surrounding area were forced to evacuate. The inhabitants of the area outside the 350 meter radius of the plant were quarantined and asked not to leave their homes and cease their agricultural activity. 15 days later, the plant was covered with sandbags, and a protection bunker was created to protect the exterior from residual gamma radiation. Due to the chaos and panic caused by the incident, the authorities warned the population not to drink water or eat anything from the harvest near the area. In total, 667 workers, members of rescue teams, and residents of the area were exposed to excessive levels of radiation. But the worst part was taken by the three employees who were present that day. A radiation dose is considered fatal when it exceeds 4 sieverts intravenously or 10 sieverts from accidental exposure. Yokokawa, who was the supervisor at the desk 4 meters from the tank, received 3 sieverts per exposure. He was treated at the Chiba National Institute of Radiological Sciences. He was discharged 3 months later with mild symptoms of radiation sickness. A year later he would face negligence charges. 40-year-old Shinohara, who was on the platform assisting with the spill, received 10 sieverts per exposure, which is considered a fatal amount. He was transported to Tokyo University Hospital. There, he underwent various radical treatments to remove the cancer from his body. He underwent multiple skin grafts and also received transfusions from frozen umbilical cord blood to increase his stem cell account. Despite his seven-month fight, he was unable to recover from radiation-induced infections and internal bleeding that resulted in the failure of his lungs and kidneys. He died on April 27th of year 2000. But by far, the worst case was Hisashi Ochi's the worker directly above the tank opening who received the most radiation. He received 17 sieverts per exposure. It is estimated that he was exposed to an amount of energy 17,000 times higher than the annual maximum allowed by the government, or the equivalent of the hypocenter of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The accident effectively destroyed Ouchi's immune system and caused his white blood cell count to drop almost to zero. As his condition worsened, the Chiba National Institute of Radiological Sciences requested his transfer to Tokyo University Hospital. Ouchi suffered severe burns to most of his body and severe damage to his internal organs. He was so vulnerable to pathogens that they had to move him to a special airtight room to limit the risk of infection. However, despite several skin transplants, he continued to leak body fluids through his pores. There, he underwent the first peripheral stem transfusion in history, but soon after, his condition worsened again. His white blood cells produced by the transplanted tissues were found to have mutated from residual radiation in his body, triggering autoimmune responses that exacerbated his deterioration. Doctors kept Ouchi alive by pumping large amounts of blood and fluids daily and treating him with medications not normally available in Japan. Antibiotics, analgesics, and granulocyte colony stimulation factor were given to him, but all attempts to cure him failed. The doctors who came to Tokyo to help with the case were surprised that Ouchi lasted so long. He was, without a doubt, the person subjected to the most radiation in the shortest time in the world. On November 27th, and despite the efforts of the doctors, his heart stopped for 70 minutes. He managed to get his pulse back, but his blood pressure was unstable even with the medications he was given. 
This was probably due to sepsis. According to the book A Slow Death, 83 Days of Radiation Sickness, Ouchi was able to communicate verbally for the first 10 days. This writing raises questions about the ethics of keeping Ouchi alive for so long, and it highlights the terrible failure of medical decision-making processes or a tremendously inhumane case of scientific curiosity. After suffering patiently for a week, Ouchi sank. I can't take it anymore. I am not a guinea pig. His words shocked the doctors and nurses who wonder if it would be better to change the focus to mere palliative care so that Ochi could live this life in peace. And even if they wanted to persevere in the treatment, what was the point of resuscitating him on the 59th day after his heart had stopped for 70 minutes? The patient's chromosomes had been completely altered. None of them could be identified or arranged. His body was destroyed from the inside out. It was a slow and painful death. Surely the doctor should have known early on that he could not be saved. But the efforts to do so indicate the high priority the government gave his case, which at the time was considered a matter of national dignity. Doctors revived Ouchi several times at the request of his family, but his condition worsened, leading to multi-organ failure. He died on December 21, 1999, after an unrecoverable cardiac arrest. The accident at Tokaimura severely undermined public faith in Japan's aggressive nuclear power program. It was established that the incident was due to mismanagement of the operation manuals added to the lack of qualifications of technicians and engineers and inadequate procedures for handling nuclear chemical products. If the company had corrected the errors of previous incidents, this case could have been less devastating or not have occurred in the first place. In October 1999, the JCO started to process compensation claims and inquiries from those affected. In July of the year 2000, 7,000 compensation claims totaling $121 million were settled. These indemnities were signed in exchange for agreeing not to sue the company again in the future. Finally, the STA cancelled the JCO credentials to operate in Japan and was the first company to be punished by the improper managing of nuclear radiation law. Six JCO officials were charged with professional negligence stemming from failing to properly train technicians and deliberately subverting safety procedures. Among them was Yokokawa, the supervisor who was in the room that day when the accident occurred. 